Good morning and welcome to the broadcast today. And thank you again for sharing another Friday morning with me. We've come almost to the end of an annual conference fiscal year, and I'm glad we're still able to greet you in the name of Jesus and to share the word of God with you today. Let me thank our faithful partners. I should say our most faithful partners, D.G. Cummins Memorial Funeral Home with Mr. James T. Cummins Jr. as the president. Thank you and God bless you and everything that you're doing uh, to advance the kingdom and may God uh, bless their business ventures. Listen, I'm going to be talking about, I've been giving you one-liners, remember. So today's one-liner that we're going to expound on is God's love to his children is inseparable. God's love to his children is inseparable. Now you can turn to Nehemiah uh, chapter 9 for the word of God today. And as you're turning, let me simply say, I've got to invite you on the fourth Sunday. Remember, we're going to have uh, Janae Sherelle Lights McGrew, Colonel Janae Sherelle uh, Lights McGrew, who's going to be our mission day speaker. Uh, she's flying in from uh, the D.C. area, Colonel in the United States Air Force, and the captain of our U.S. cyber security. And so I'm excited about that. I'm tremendously excited because the young lady is from Wetumpka, Alabama. And you know how much Wetumpka, Alabama means to me. Now, uh, that being said, it's uh, 2 o'clock in the afternoon service. It's at 2 because we want to salute all of you military women, females only, will we be saluting on that fourth Sunday afternoon in September, two o'clock. All right, that being the case, let's get into the word of God. Father, thank you for the word today and for the privilege it is to offer your word to your children again. We praise you and we bless you because you are the source of our existence. You are our savior and you're the one who has imparted the Holy Spirit and spiritual gifts and graces to us. So we thank you every day of our lives. May we always lift our voices in praise and thanksgiving. Now we ask you as always, give us humility of head and heart so that we are not just hearers of the word, but doers of the word of God. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so uh, God's love to his children is inseparable. Now our springboard and actually our foundation for this uh, one sentence is from Nehemiah chapter nine. And what is happening in Nehemiah nine is that the children of Israel and Ezra, the priest and Levites, they're getting ready to have what I would call a uh, national confession day. They're admitting their sins, the sins of their fathers and mothers, and they go on and on and on with that. But it's in the confessing that you get a chance to see the inseparable love of God toward his children. For as they are confessing their sins, they're going to say a lot of different things about God. And I'm going to be reading them to you. Now, let me read the first uh, couple of verses here. Uh, just as our springboard uh, for the scripture. Now, on the 24th day of the, the, this month, the people of Israel were assembled with fasting and sackcloth. That's very rough clothing, something like burlap, and with earth on their heads, which is their form now. They're fasting, they're praying, they're repenting. So they're dressed in sackcloth, which made them uncomfortable. Uh, they have ashes on their heads, uh, which is a sign that they are from the dust of the earth. And uh, they are fasting with repentance. Look at verse two. Then those are of Israelite descent separated themselves from all foreigners and stood and confessed their sins 
and the iniquities of their ancestors. Now, remember the separation from foreigners in the Nehemiah passage and some other Old Testament passages would not be the same as people talking about separating from foreigners now. In the Old Testament, God had commanded Israel that they should not intermarry with uh, idolaters, those who had idols in the land. They were to stay clear of them, free of them, never to intermarry with those who had idols in the land. In this case, Israel had intermarried, ignored the commandments of God. And so when they were on their national day of repentance, uh, that is to change their mind, go another direction, uh, correct their wrongs, they separated themselves from those they had married of foreign descent who probably were idol worshipers or who had to be idol worshipers. Now, I will say they had to be because Moses married a foreigner. He married an Ethiopian and he didn't have to separate. Uh, Jacob, uh, uh, rather not Jacob, David married Bathsheba, who was married to uh, Uriah the Hittite, so of, of foreign descent. And you've got others who uh, intermarried. You've got Esther marrying a Persian king, or you've got uh, uh, Ruth uh, married the Moabites, marrying uh, Boaz, who was both of Israelite and Canaanite descent. And so there were plenty of intermarriages, uh, interracial marriages in scripture. And so God didn't condemn interracial marriages. All right. But I don't want to get into that today. I want to talk about how God's love for Israel was inseparable and unending. And I want to talk about it from that perspective because uh, God's love for you is inseparable and unending as children of God. And I'll end with the passage from Romans chapter eight, which highlights this for the Christian church. Now, the, what I like about this confessional from the Israelites, uh, it says one fourth of the day, uh, Ezra and the priests, they read the word of God to them. Then another fourth of the day, they confess their sins. I continue to say, you know, if we hear the word of God and we don't change, uh, that's bad. That's very bad. When we hear the word of God and the word of God convicts us of our sins, uh, then there should be repentance. And they did that in the nation here. Now, it's in their confessions about how their their ancestors have sinned and how they have sinned uh, that we hear them bragging on the inseparable love of God and the faithfulness of the Almighty God to them. And that's what I want you to pay special attention to. So I'm going to give you some verses, uh, quite a few of them if you're writing, so you'll want to write these because I'm not going to read them. All right, verses seven through eight. They said to God in their confessions, you chose Abraham and established your covenant with Abraham. And so the first dynamic about the inseparable love of God, God began this love affair with Abraham, the father of the faithful. All right. And God chose him. Remember, Abraham didn't choose God. God chose Abraham. I still remember uh, sitting in a class and we had a, a Catholic guest uh, present as, as an instructor with the instructor that day. And I still remember him emphasizing uh, for the church how we did not choose Jesus. He chose us. Yes, that's what Jesus told his disciples in John chapter 15, verse 16. You did not choose me. I chose you and I appointed you that you would go and bear much fruit and your fruit should remain. And so the inseparable love of God began when God chose Abraham, Nehemiah chapter nine, verses seven through eight. 
and establish his covenant of blessing with Abraham. You remember he told Abraham, I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. And he said, people who uh, come after you one way, they will go away from you in seven ways. I mean, God was specific telling Abraham, I will be very, very good to you. So imagine Israel confessing their sins and saying to God, we remember you chose our ancestor Abraham and you established your covenant with him. Then verses 9 through 15, uh, uh, they confessed to God or declared to God. They went from Abraham to the bondage in Egypt. And so now uh, the priest Ezra and the, the uh, scribe Ezra and the priest and others were saying to God, when we were in bondage in Egypt, God, you delivered us out of Egypt. God sent 10 plagues. God opened the Red Sea. God led them in the wilderness. Pillar of fire by night, a cloud in the day, and an angel. Uh, God gave them 10 commandments. Fed them manna from on high. Dropped it out of the sky every morning. Fresh bread. And gave them quail overnight. Excuse me. And gave them water. Uh, from a polluted water and then water from a rock. So he worked all these miracles because God healed the polluted waters and then God gave them water from a rock. And so while they are confessing their sins to God, they said to him, remember now, this is what you've done for us. Even though they had messed up, they said to God, Look at how you have loved us. You skip from that point and you go to verses 16 through 25. Now listen to this. They confessed to God after you had blessed us and brought us out of Egypt and led us in the wilderness. We became stubborn. We became rebellious. But your mercy kept us and caused us to possess uh, the promised land. So Israel said to God, we know we've been stubborn. Have you ever told God that? We know we have been rebellious. I hope you haven't had to tell God that. But if you have, it's okay. They said to God, we've been stubborn. We have been rebellious. But in our stubbornness and in our rebelliousness, you showed us mercy and you showed us right on into the promised land and we possessed the promised land. And we had houses that we didn't build and we had wells that we didn't dig and we had vineyards that we didn't plant. So they are still bragging on what? The inseparable love of God. They said to God, you chose us. Then you came and delivered us from bondage, but then we became stubborn and rebellious, but you still loved us, and you had mercy on us, and you allowed us to possess the promised land. Verses 26 through 27 says it this way. Uh, we were rebellious, we repented, and then you restored us. Now, when you read the book of Judges, it happens over and over again. That's a, uh, what I call a bad cycle that took place. Israel would have rest, that is, peace with their enemies. Things are going well. They are prospering. And then they would become complacent. And they start worshiping, serving idol gods. The next thing you know, uh, God has allowed their enemies to capture them and to put them in bondage. And after a while, they cried out unto God. God heard their cry, raised up a deliverer, and the deliverer delivered them. And they had rest and peace all over again. But before long, the cycle repeats itself. I heard somebody say uh, this week, I think it was, 
that some of us need to get off the merry-go-round. We've been doing the same thing over and over again, receiving or getting the same results over and over again, and you can't get a different result until you get off the merry-go-round. I wish I, I might need to preach that myself. Get off the merry-go-round, all right? Now, and so Israel said to God, although we were rebellious, we, when we repented, you restored us. Doesn't that sound like the inseparable love of God? We've missed a mark. We've not done what we were supposed to do. We've done what we were told not to do. But when we repent, God is faithful and just. That's what the text says. The Bible says, uh, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We have a, we say it like this on the first Sunday uh, from the epistle of Second John, I believe it is. Uh, if anyone has sinned, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is a propitiation for our sins, the pleasing sacrifice for our sins, and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. Wherefore, those of you who do truly and earnestly repent of your sins and are in love and charity with your neighbors and intend a new life, following the commandments of God and walking from his forth in his holy way, draw near with faith. Take the holy sacrament to your comfort and devoutly kneeling. And so we say that every first Sunday, Israel said something that was akin to that over and over and over again because they were on the merry-go-round. And you know how the merry-go-round is. Have you ever been on a merry-go-round? I used to love the merry-go-round on the playground. You grab a hold to the rail and you start running and you jump on the merry-go-round and it just takes you around and around in a circle for a little while. And when it slows down, you can get off and you can start running it around again. But listen to this, as long as somebody's turning the merry-go-round, you are not supposed to get off. Israel was habitual in staying on the merry-go-round. And then when God would get them off, they would sin again and get back on the merry-go-round. But listen to this, God would not turn his love away from Israel. Even though they kept getting on the merry-go-round, God kept showing back up. Verses 28 through 31 uh, tell us the same thing as 26 through 27, basically, that the people were rebellious, they would repent, and then God would restore. Now, when they finished making all of these confessions to God, they then began to plea for help based on God's covenant God's faithfulness and God's mercy. And so I want to begin reading now at the 32nd verse of Nehemiah chapter 9. Listen to what he says. We're talking about uh, God's love for his children is inseparable. And I just let me read this and we'll, we'll wrap it up. Listen to this. Now, therefore, our God, the great and mighty and awesome God, keeping covenant and steadfast love. Do not treat lightly all the hardship that has come upon us, upon our kings, our officials, our priests, our prophets, our ancestors, and all your people since the time of the kings of Assyria until today. You have been just in all that has come upon us, for you have dealt faithfully and we have acted wickedly. Our kings, our officials, our priests, and our ancestors have not kept your law or heeded the commandments and the warnings that you gave them. Even in their own kingdom and in the great goodness you bestowed on them and in the large and rich land that you set before them, they did not serve you and did not turn from their wicked ways. 
of works. Here we are, slaves to this day, slaves in the land that you gave to our ancestors to enjoy its fruit and its good gifts. You have said over us, because of our sins, they have power also over our bodies and over our livestock at their pleasure, and we are in great distress. Because all of this, we make a firm agreement in writing, and on that sealed document are inscribed the names of our officials, our Levites, and our priests. And so at the end of Nehemiah chapter 9, the Israelites, or the children of God, said to God, you've been faithful. You've been merciful. You have kept your covenant. You've never left us outside of uh, a remnant and outside of the ark of safety and outside the realm of your love and care. But we were bad. But you got to like the last thing they said. But God, we're, we've gotten it together now. We're getting off the merry-go-round. We're responding to your inseparable love, and we're making a written agreement today that we will be faithful to you. Wow. Now, God loves us. I've said this many, many times. I like saying it. It's a true saying. I have never been uh, in a place or lived my life where I did not know people loved me. And I've never lived uh, without the knowledge of knowing that God loves me. I don't get all bogged down into people not appreciating. Uh, some people can hurt you, have hurt us. But listen, I know God loves me. And I thank God. And I hope you know that God loves you. And his love, the Bible teaches us, is inseparable to the children of God. In other words, we cannot be separated from God's love. Israel confessed to God. We see you, God, being faithful, being merciful, keeping your covenant with us. Your love was inseparable. Whether we were in Egypt, whether we were under uh, the Assyrian kings, your love was inseparable. Even when we messed up, when we didn't get off the merry-go-round, when we did not do right, when we didn't keep your laws, when we rebelled, they said to God, you have been faithful. You have been merciful. And so God never leaves us out in the cold or by ourselves. <laughs> Somebody say, said to me, well, don't tell me God loves me because this has happened to me. Don't tell me he loves me the way they've hurt me. And I always say to them, he loves you. The fact that something happened to you bad, that doesn't mean God doesn't love you. God sent his only begotten son to die on a cross for the sins of the world. That's the evidence that he loves you. You may not have your way or get your way or have what you want to have or get to the place where you want to get to. But listen, that has nothing to do with whether or not God loves you. God does love you because he sent his son to die on the cross that you might be saved. Now, since we're the church, there are times we need, as I just said, to confess our sins to God understanding God has never abandoned us, never walked us from us, never separated himself from us, never said, like I said, I'm not going to have anything else to do with him or with her. God's love is inseparable. Let me read to you my closing passage from the uh, epistle to the church at Rome by Apostle Paul, chapter 8, the 31st verse. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? 
he who did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for all of us, will he not with him also give us everything else? Who will bring in a charge against God's elect, against the church? Is it God who justifies, or it is God who justifies? Who is to condemn? It is Christ Jesus who died, yes, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us, who will separate us from the love of Christ. Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword as it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. This is the Apostle Paul testifying on how the Christian church and prophets and apostles were living from day to day in Paul's day. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Now, who loved us? God loved us through Jesus Christ, and he died on a cross for us. Listen to this. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor death, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. My friends, my brothers and sisters, we live inside the wonderful confines of the love of God. His love for us is inseparable. It didn't matter what anybody says. God loves you. Say, well, I messed up. And God still loves you. So I've fallen short. And we all have. God still loves you. Say, well, you don't know my story. I don't need to know your story. God loves you. Because the Bible says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever liveth and believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. God loves you, but he doesn't just love you. He loves me too, but he doesn't just love me too. He loves the rest of the human beings in his creation. And so Nehemiah chapter nine is not just about the confession of the children of Israel, although it is, they made their confession and they repented. But you can see by reading this chapter how strongly God loved Israel and how strongly God loves us. Father, I thank you today for the inseparable love that you have shown us. None of us have been perfect. Some of us have been foolish and stupid and godless. But you have loved us enough to send your only begotten son. And I ask you now, manifest Jesus in the lives of all of those who hurt me if they don't know him. And if they do know him, I give you thanks for the assurance that will live inside of them. Abide inside of them, declaring just how much they love you and you love them. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, my time is about up again. Thank you again, sharing uh, the pastor's study on this Friday morning. Remember, on the fourth Sunday, we're going to have Colonel Janae Sherrill Likes McGrew, who is the captain of U.S. Cyberspace 
Uh, I might have said that incorrectly, but I want you to be here. She's flying in from Washington, D.C. area to be with us, to be our Missions Day speaker. And I've got a focus on females in the military performing all kinds of missions. They are mothers. They are wives. Uh, they are grandmothers. They are children. They are grandchildren. And they are making indelible differences in our lives from day to day. That's the fourth Sunday of this month, two o'clock right here in the sanctuary. Until the next time, which I trust will be a few days, this is Claude Schubert, E.G. Cummins Memorial Funeral Home, the Mount Zion Church family. We bid you Godspeed. Have a great weekend. Bye-bye now. <laughs>